My name is Alex Sodo. I work in Red Hat. I'm a contributor of several uh, magazines, and also I'm the key author of Testing Java Microservices book, which today I'm ruffling two, two um, copies of the book. I mean, it's the electronic version of the book. You just need to follow me on Twitter with a picture of the session, mention me with the hashtag JFall, and then you will uh, get into the raffle. And if you are the winner, you will get it a dis uh, uh, discount count of the 100% of the value of the electronic version of this book. So if there is any question, please don't. I mean, you can wait until the end. I will be around the venue during today, so you can stop me and ask me then. But if you want, you can do it just in time. So this is um, just an idea of what's happening uh, in the Java system. You can see here that Java was created in 1996, and it becomes really, really popular in 1999 with the release of Java J2EE when we started, you know, creating all these serverless applications, right? This is when Java becomes really popular. But then if you see clear here, Kubernetes was created in 2014. So it was like 15 years after Java was, or Java EE was created. So what was happening in 1999? Well, let's take the, you know, the time machine. This movie was released, and I remember clearly watching Trinity doing this, you know, this kick at the beginning of the movie with all this uh, bullet time um, um, scene. That I think that was the first time it was in a in a movie, so it was really nice um, to see it. Also, you, if you got kids, Tarzan and Toy Story 2 was released in 1999, and also the top five of the songs of the year were all of them done by uh, females, which was really great news. And since we are here, and probably all of you knows, or already knows that football is really special, and you know that in 1999, FIFA wants the, uh, sorry, um, USA wants the FIFA World Cup, right? Yeah, they won the FIFA World Cup. But let's go back to something more serious and going to the cost of a Java-based application in 1999. And basically, you can see that you need to build, you know, APP servers, web, uh, be a web logic or, or any other application server, uh, all the Oracle databases and the racks for the database. And something that it was really interesting is that you also need to pay for your IDE Right, this Visual Cafe, because in 1999 there was no Net, uh, there was no NetBeans or IntelliJ or Eclipse or you know any of these IDs that we have nowadays. So you can see here you needed like half a um, um, half a million dollars for creating just a Hello World in Java to put it in production, and of course this has changed a lot because nowadays we've got cloud, right? And since we've got into the cloud computing, we are not paying anymore for having all our hardware on site. Probably the, um, in the past, the place where you, are de where you were developing your application, you still have all the machines there. Nowadays, it's something different. You are paying for CPU and memory. So you don't need to spend thousands of dollars on, you know, on the hardware. You just pay as you need. So as you can see now, now and nowadays, if you are into the cloud computing, memory and CPU is something really important. The more CPU you use, the more you pay. The more memory you use, the more you pay. So it's not only about this, it's about also Kubernetes. I'm sure that most of you are using Java 8. I don't know if you have tried to put Java 8 inside a Docker container or Kubernetes, but it's really painful, and it's painful because of the memory usage of Java 8. Of course, you can fix it with, you know, setting some kind of, um, let's say, flex to avoid that your Java application goes beyond its limits. And also, if you don't do that, what's going to happen is that this container is going to be stopped by the kernel. And when it's stopped, if you are into Kubernetes, then it's going to be restarted. So from the point of view of a Java developer, probably you don't care because at the end, Kubernetes will restart automatically the pod, so the application is still there, but it is something that it's happening because Java was created long, long before 
Kubernetes was here. But it's not only about Kubernetes, it's, that it's also about serverless. You can see here some of the topics that say, in my honest opinion, you really should not be using Spring Boot for lambdas. The reason for this is that if you are into the serverless, what you really need is to boot up really fast, and this is something that in Java it's quite painful. And also, you need to use a really, really, really a slow, a low memory footprint because in serverless environments, you're, cons you're really constrained by all the hardware. So, of course, you might say, well, but it's pretty fast. I mean, that I can take my application and boot up in one or two seconds, which is fine, but if you're into serverless, this is not going to work pretty well. And again, with the memory, it happens something similar. And some of the Java developers are thinking um, themselves, why I cannot deploy my Java application into you know, a container or into Kubernetes like I can do with Go? Really easy. I just take a binary, I put it inside a really, really thin Docker container, and that's all, right? You cannot do this in Java. So this is exactly what we are going to try to fix with Quarkus. So Quarkus is just an open source project sponsored by Red Hat that enables you to start creating Kubernetes native applications, but not just Kubernetes native applications, also into the serverless ecosystem with really fast boot up times and low memory footprint. And when I'm saying that it's really fast is that with Quarkus, you can get it an enterprise application that it's 10 times smaller and 100 times faster. And it's true, it's 100 times, you'll see it. But it's not just about creating, you know, Kubernetes native applications, it's also about making development ex or improving the development experience when we are into the, or developing Java enterprise applications. And if you're coming from Node.js, you already know these kind of things. For example, with Node.js, you can uh, have your source code, do a modification, save this, modifi save this file, and automatically this change is populated to your running instance. So you can really check if it's work or not really fast. But in Java, you don't have something like this. What you usually do is just, okay, I've got here my source file, I modify it, I do maybe a clean package, I have in a jar file, and then I do java menu jar, and then I try if it works or not. If it's not working, then I need to do control C, I stop that instance, go to my, my editor, I modify, I save my clean package, java menu jar, and I check if it works or not. Right? This is a really different thing between Node.js and Java. And with Quarkus, you will be able to start doing these kind of things in Java as well. And this is what we call live reload. You will see in the demo what it's live reload, which allows you to do this kind of thing. Just modify your source file, and the change is populated automatically to your running instance. It's really easy to use with imperative approach, but also with reactive. It's ready for serverless and microservices. You can just use it as a file jar. This means that Quarkus can be run inside a JVM, like you are probably doing nowadays for example, with the Spring Boot or with Wildfly or with Vertex. But we are also offering a really nice integration with RAL VM to provide you a native executable for your enterprise's APIs. And finally, yeah, it, draw, it works with JAX, JAX RS, uh, JPA, microprofile specs, and CDI, etc., etc. So the annotations, it's nothing new. It's the things that are already out there. And of course, it's Kubernetes native. And now, if you want to understand exactly how Quarkus works, the central piece of Quarkus is one thing that is called extensions. And I mean, that some people get confused about this. Just think about that. An extension is just a jar file that you put in your class path. That's all. You just open your build tool script, you put it in the jar file, and that's all. And as far as uh, version 0.27, which was released yesterday night, we've got support for all these um, Stuff. I mean, addressed AZ, Evernate, Vertex, Microprofile Specs, Jigars, Flyway, Cogito, I don't know, Kafka, for example, as well, and Bolt for security, Amazon Lambdas, Azure Functions are supported as well. And one of the 
interesting thing that we're going to look at later is the support for a Spring Boot. How about performance? OK, we'll, you'll see the boot up time, which is like milliseconds instead of seconds. But what is really interesting is the memory. And this graph is you know, an application that I uh, deployed to Kubernetes. This is the Prometheus um, dashboard. And you can see that there are three lines. The first one, this one, the, bl the blue one, it's a traditional cloud-native Java stack. And you can see that it takes around 100 megabytes of memory. This is the full memory. And then there is another one here, which is like this light blue, this one. OK, the second one, which is 25 megabytes, which is the same application, but written in Node.js, which is uh, a really big save. And finally, this green one, the last one, which is like 15, uh, mem uh, 50 memory, uh, megabytes, it's for Quarkus. This is a Java application running inside a container which performs better than a Node.js application, and of course, much, much better than any of the cloud-native Java stacks out there. And this is thanks of GraalVM, which compiles your um, Java application into an, uh, an executable Java file. But of course, I mean that you will, I will not show you because it takes like one minute and a half. To compile into native, it takes around one minute and a half, two minutes, it depends on the machine. So this is something that you need to take into consideration. That when you are moving to native executables, you need to think that you're going to need to spend like two minutes to compile all this Java stuff into a native stuff. And that's all. Let's see it in um, some demo about Quarkus. To get us started with Quarkus, it's really easy. You just need to go to um, code.quarkus.io. OK, you go here, and then you just set the group ID. We can set here, for example, greetings, greetings, for example, or yeah, greeting. And we can add all the extensions that we want to add. You see here, there is all the list of extensions. Let's add, for example, uh, JSONB. Wait, no. Rest JSONB to you know, buy or marshal and marshalling Java objects from to JSON. We can also add, for example, metrics, because it's really important, right, to check the metrics of your application running. We can add Kubernetes, because well, we are going to deploy to Kubernetes, and I think that for now, yeah, that's all. If not, we can add it later. OK, I'm going to generate it. And let's see if we are lucky enough with the Wi-Fi. OK, if not, no worries. OK. Um, no Wi-Fi, but I've got here, I guess, the application. I think that is this one. OK. Then, this is um, what you get it when you produce with this method. This is. My, I mean, this is the a scaffolded project, a really simple project. I'm using Visual Studio Code. It works pretty well uh, in, for developing in Java. And I've got, if you want to develop, you, what, the only thing that you need to add is this Java extension pack, which is, you know, it comes from Red Hat, which we have like 3 million downloads. So, yeah, you can use it because it's well tested. Now, you can see this project. I have here an example resource which basically is a JAX arrest um, endpoint. I've got the path with hello, and I've got the get, and then I've got the return hello. And I'm going to start with a live reload mode. Basically, I'm just doing maybe compile Quarkus dep, and this basically compiles the project and just does not stop it. It's, you know, here waiting for something. Waiting for what? That I do an HTTP request. 
In this case, I'm going to do a slash, I think that it's hello. And I'm getting the hello message. Then, what's happening if I'm going here and I said, OK, but I don't want to put hello, I want to put aloha. Notice that I'm just changing my Java file. I just save it. And then I do HTTP, hello. And I'm getting aloha. I have not stopped it, uh, package it again, and then doing the Java menu jar. It's automatically done. What's happening if, for example, I don't do this, but I just hear a set, oh, I'm going to do this, which is a completion error, but I don't know, and I'm going to do this. Of course, you've got Java Lorem time exception, compilation fail, aloha misses, and uncloses the string, literal. So we are compiling your code at the server side. I'm going to fix this, OK? Now, what's happening if, for example, you want to get the message from a configuration file? Well, we've got the, uh, the application.properties file, where you put all your um, configuration options, as well the configuration options of the extension. So I do greetings.message equal, for example, hola. I can go here, and I'm going to use the microprofile config spec to inject the configuration value. So I'm just putting config property. Notice that the import is from org eclipse microprofile because it's an spec. The name is greetings.message. This is a string message. I put here the message. Oops. Thing. OK, and again, I don't need to recompile anything. I'm going to clear this. And this is the OLA. So I can change any resource, and it's automatically populated when I do the request. Remember that I said that I add, uh, I've also added um, the metrics, because it's important to get metrics. So you added the extension of metrics, and then automatically, without doing, doing anything, there is an, a slash metrics endpoint available for your Prometheus. Remember that by default, Prometheus is trying to get information from a slash metrics. So I put this, and you can see that I get it all the metrics of the application. By default, JVM, uh, objects created, memory, I don't know, there is a lot of uh, swap size, etc. I get it for free. I don't need to do anything. Just add the, exten uh, add the extension, and that's all. And another thing that it comes is, oh, look, OK, thanks, too late. It's Swagger UI. You can add the Open API extension, and then I've got the Swagger API, which is automatically generated. So you can see here that I've got it a get of hello. I'm, you know, you're getting all the information. I can put try it out and do an execute, and of course I'm getting Ola as a response. Of course, this is a really simple example. Let's move a bit forward and let's try to see how it works when there is. Um, um, database, for example. I'm going to start MariaDB here, which is, uh, well, it just, you know, I got Docker here and I initialize MariaDB in a Docker container and I have here SQL, which basically it's uh, UI for, uh, for my SQL. I can do a connect and now I'm connected, nothing is created. Then, if I want to start doing a database, I need two things. The first one is adding Ibernate, which in fact is not Ibernate, it's Panache, because with Quarkus we have the Panache framework, which makes all this complicated stuff of Ibernate simple. And also you need to add the JDBC driver. To add them, we can just run um, Maven, Quarkus, list extensions which provides us with all the extensions that are out there, which are, it's the same that you see in the UI on the web page. And I, I'm going to add the Quarkus OERM Hibernate. Quarkus. Again, remember that the only thing that I'm doing here is adding, you know, a, pom, um, a jar file inside my build, uh, in, in this case, in pom.xml. So I'm not just doing something um, really different. And the next thing is the MariaDB which should be here, okay, copy from here to here, and I run it. 
and the extensions are added. And if you check here the build, uh, the POM, you see that there are two new, um, where is this? Where are, mm -mm. Oh, I run it. Oh, I run it in the wrong place. Okay, great. Mm -mm. I'm going to run it here. Now. Oh. Why? Okay. Always. And then uh, you can see here that the dependency is just added. It's just a shortcut for adding the, all these dependencies. And then let's create it a new Pojo object. Let's call it developer, the Java. I'm going to create a new class. And the first thing that I need to use is to extend this class from Panache Entity. The reason is that Panache is a framework that implements the active record pattern and the data access object pattern. In this case, I'm going to use the active record pattern, which is something that is really familiar with Ruby and, and Rails uh, users, which is putting all the operations or all the database operations inside the entity object. So I'm going to extend this from Panache Entity. And I'm going to use the entity um, annotation. Notice that this is the JPA annotation. And I'm going to create a new field called name. And that's all. Since I'm extending from Panache Entity, there is a default ID, which is of type long. And notice that I'm putting the field as public. Probably some of you will say, oh, this is an anti-pattern. OK, maybe it is I'm an anti-pattern. But don't worry, because here it's public. But, but, but when we are compiling the Quarkus uh, application, we are just replacing all these public fields into private and creating the getters and setters. So the bytecode contains the getters and setters. But you, as a developer, can just start dealing directly with the public fields. Of course, you can still just using private and getters and setters, and then uh, Quarkus will do anything with this stuff. But you can you know, get it and using public. The next thing that we need to do here is create a post method to create a new developer. Let's create here a post that produces a JSON. Well, not produces, not produces nothing, but consumes consumes JSON. Type JSON. Okay, I'm just saying I want to get. Um, information from a JSON, and then I can set a response on a developer, and the developer that I'm getting here is an object of type developer. This is the developer that I've created before. Of course, since I know that I'm going to insert this developer, I need to mark this uh, method as transactional. If not, then the, the transaction is not committed, and the um, changes will not be reflected on the database. Notice here I'm using developer. And then I need to persist this developer. And the only thing that I need to do is just take developer dot persist. And I can do this because developer extends from Panache Entity. And Panache Entity contains all the methods to persist, to find, to delete, to update, and so on. And finally, I can do a return of response. Respond dot OK dot build. We're almost done. We have configured our endpoint to just uh, store a developer, we created a developer. The last thing that we need to do is configure all the database things. And in this case, there is an, um, an, a, an a snippet in uh, Visual Studio Code for Quarkus, which allows me to you know, configure automatically all the stuff. Basically, it's the, the URL, the driver, the username, the password, and the ORM database generation. So we are almost done. Now I can go. Here, in, in the correct window, yeah. I'm going to start the application. OK, there it is. I can go here. I can refresh. Of course, now I see that there is a get and there is a post. I can go to the post, try it out. ID is not necessary. And the name, I'm going to put Alex. I can do an execute, 
And now, of course, I get it an OK. And if you check here, you see that there is a developer table with the name Alex here. OK, now let's see something more interesting, which is like, how about adding the H? I'm going to put public int H. I save it. OK. I'm going here. I'm going to refresh the UI. Of course, I have the post. I notice that now the H is here. So I can do a tryout. I'm going to remove the ID. I'm going to put H, for example, 7, and a new developer, Adam. And I do an execute, and you've got an OK. And you may say, how is this possible? You've added a new field, and you've got a transaction to a database. OK, let's see what's happening in the database. And there is the H column without doing anything. I have not redeployed anything. I've just not stopped the application, nothing. I'm just going to my IDE, do the changes, do the HTTP request, and boom, everything is updated automatically. Right, this is really powerful. This is what I say that we are trying to improve the developer experience with Quarkus. We can just start trying things and doing things, check what is happening without having to losing time on packaging and redeploying again and again our application. Of course, this is a, let's say, simple example, but you see that it's really powerful. The last thing that we can do, for example, is deploy this to Kubernetes. To do that, remember that I've added the Kubernetes extension. I don't know if now it's here. Let me check. No, it's not added. OK, I can add it. Um, well, before, let me show you, let me show you what, it, what it means that it takes a lot of time to do a native compilation. To do a native compilation, you need to have GraalVM installed, right? And you are producing a, a native executable for the machine where you are running the GraalVM. So you have to have GraalVM for Mac, and if you run GraalVM on Mac, you get it an executable for Mac. The problem is that if you want to go to um, Docker, what you need is to produce a native executable that can be run inside the Docker container. So this means that you need to have a, Docker con a GraalVM inside a Docker container compiling your application. To make all these kind of things simple, we've got in um, Quarkus, we are offering an, another uh, option, which is, uh, um, no. Let me, here, no. OK. Package. Because we changed it, let me check, because we, in 0, 0 0.27, we changed the flag, and I don't remember the name memory, but it's really history. It's ba -ba 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 -bum. native image. No, or maybe it's this one. Okay. Well, let's try this one because now I, I know that we've changed it, and now I cannot remember if it's this one or not. Let me find it. OK, this is not, wait. It was, bum, 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 bum. this is because, well, this is explained here now. If you are lucky enough, you'll see, uh, I think it's not, not here. Bum, bum. Docker. Mm -mm. Here, not, but we are close. Not. Oh, man. OK, well, now I cannot find it. But it's, you know, you do this, but the property is not, it's not called native image Docker built. It, it, I mean, they have changed it last night. And it's, I don't remember now. And it's basically, it takes all your code, it put it inside a Docker container, which this Docker container already have GraalVM. It compiles your application, and then the output is a native application that can be run inside a Docker container. And this process usually takes like um, one minute and a half. I have already have done this process. Um, if I do a Docker run, um, for example, this, 
Okay, this is the uh, application that I've showed you now, but I've done it yesterday. And if I do a run, you see that it just started with 55 milliseconds. And this is just a Java application, right? Just think about, okay, you can say that you want to use plain Java and it starts in four seconds, five seconds, that's fine. But notice that you can do it with 55 seconds, which is really awesome for the serverless computing. Now, the last, uh, or the, not the last thing, but almost, is the way to add uh, Kubernetes. So you want to deploy this to Kubernetes. You can just do add the Kubernetes extension. OK, and now when I do maven clean package minus the skip test, just for going quick. OK, now I've got a jar file, right? I'm just compiling in Java mode, not in native mode. For this reason, it takes really fast to compile. But the important thing is that in target Kubernetes, there is a Kubernetes YAML, which is an opinionated YAML with for, for you know for deploying this application into um, into Kubernetes. One of the important things that we are also offering is that if apart from having Kubernetes, you are using health checks, right? Because it's something that you should have. And I am going to do health uh, checks. Now I'm adding them. Uh, it's not called health check. It's called. That's health now. Now what I'm just adding is the microprofile health check. So it allows me to do health checks for my application. But by default, by just adding this extension, we are providing these health checks for you. So now we can do again this Quarkus, um, for example, compile Quarkus dev. And by default, I can have all this stuff on um, mm -mm. health slash life for life check. Notice that I'm saying that the life check is up. This is something that I've just added the, the, the um, extension and I provide this. But the important thing here is that if I do in a slash ready, that is for a readiness check of Kubernetes, I'm getting that the database connection health check is up. If I just stop the database, then this is down. So by default, we are you know, checking how is your um, application done, and then we provide health checks for you. And now that you've seen this, and you've seen that I've got this opinionated um, Kubernetes file, I'm going to change this to the container image that I've created yesterday, so you don't, we don't have to wait one minute and a half to compile it, which is right, basically here. I'm changing this to Lord of Shores. Okay, I don't know. I think that it's greetings. I think that it's greetings. Uh, getting started. Okay. Getting started. And this is like this. Okay, now I've got Kubernetes cluster running on my machine. This is important. I'm not in a cloud, I'm in my machine. So now I can do kubectl, apply, minus f, target Kubernetes, Kubernetes YAML. Okay, do kubectl, get pods. And you see that the pod is, run the pod is running. I'm going to uh, start gaining, oops, gaining s. Mm -mm. Ah, never mind. We can do it in this way. OK, now we've got here one pod. And you can say, OK, let's scale it to two pods. QCTL scale, and uh, it's code with Quarkus. Code with Quarkus. I'm going to scale to two. Remember that this is a Kubernetes cluster running on my machine. And now it's a scale, and I do QCTL get pods, and I get it. Oops. And I get it two pods running on my machine. A Java application with two pods running on my machine. And you said, OK, that's nice, but how about 20? Right? 
Have you ever tried to run 20 Java applications on your Minikube? Well, try it and see what's happening. But OK, I'm going to get pods, and you see that there are almost all of them running. OK, now all of them running on my machine. But you could say, yeah, but I can put it all my CPUs, all my RAM, and I'm still being able to do a deploy of 20 uh, Java applications on my Kubernetes. So I think that you should move to 100. Let's move it. And let's wait a bit. I mean, this takes a bit of time. Let me show you. Meanwhile, it usually takes like two minutes, but to not having you two minutes here ch checking how all the containers are created. Let me show you another example, which is here, which is for React, oops, reactive stuff. But let me first of all remove one important thing that I've added by error, which is the ORM and the panache. OK, now, I've got this example, which basically takes beers from an external database service, uh, or ex external REST API service. So I'm getting all the beers. And well, OK, a beer has some fields. And here I've got the beer gateway. This is the way to communicate to another REST API. In this case, I'm using the microprofile REST client, and I'm getting that I want to go to a slash b2 a slash beers using HTTP, which gets a JSON. I can even set headers. And I'm setting the page. Because all the, pa all the beers in the world, there are a lot, a lot of beers. So you need to paginate. And if you want to grab all the beers, you need to know page by page by page, right? And then this returns a list of beers. This is how I interact with an external REST, uh, REST service. You, you may wonder, it. OK, I'm going to slash b2 slash beers. But where are the URL? Of course, the URL is in the application.properties. And you can see here this property, which is called beer gateway. This is the class mprest slash URL is api.pangapi.com. So I'm putting the URL here. So all the paths are on the class, but the URL is here. So you can configure, depending on if you're in a test environment, a stage environment, a production environment, the URL you, that you want to access. And that's fine. And then suppose that I, I'm saying to you, I want to get all these beers to, you know, to my users. One thing to do that is just start iterating and getting all of them and putting inside a list. But then I said, yeah, but it's not just this. I want to get only the beers which have ABB greater than 10, right? Then what we will do is just start getting all the pages, putting all these beers in memory, filter, and then return this, the amount of beers that fills this condition, right? And notice that you are spending a lot, a lot of memory on this. For this reason, what I'm using here is reactive programming, or a, a reactive approach, which is using the reactive X spec. And I'm saying something like this. I'm just saying, I want to generate an emitter. Right? So it's like a meter is the, the one who is going to produce these beers and put all these beers inside a stream. And notice that here I'm setting that the first page is the number one. I'm saying get the beers from the page number one. If it's empty, it means that there is no more beers to grab. And if not, just get the next beers. Finally, return page plus one. So I'm just doing some kind of recursion, checking that give me the next page, give me the beers, give me the page, give me the beers, you know, and so on. And I'm returning this stream as an iterable. And you may say, OK, this is something similar to what you have mentioned in me, because you are creating a big, big list with all the beers inside. But do you see that now that it's not like this? Because here, I'm just setting return beer service.beers. OK, this is what returns this method. And filter by ABB greater than 10. And notice that I'm returning a publisher. A publisher is a reactive class. So what I'm doing here is just saying, OK, I know that I want to have all these beers, but only the strongest beers. So instead of loading all the beers all the time, I'm just going to get the first page, filter for the beers that I am interested, in this case, these ones, and discard the rest and go to the next page. Then filter and go to the next page, filter and go to the next page. So instead of storing all the objects in memory, I'm just storing the ones that I'm interested. 
Now I can do, I think that I have finished to scale all the, all the pods. Let me check. Yeah, 100 pods running. And I'm still developing. I mean, that seems that the machine is not suffering a lot. So it's really nice. So let's continue with this. I can do compile, Quarkus step. And I'm going to get all the beers. It's running. 80 slash beers slash all. And I'm getting all the beers. Notice that I'm getting all the pages, one, two, three, four, five, six. This, I'm, I'm getting all outside. I mean, that this is an outside uh, site. For the reason, it takes a bit of time. And then finally, it returns all the beers with ABB greater than 10. And you will say, OK, so now I'm saving a lot of memory. But notice when this is really powerful. I'm, notice that there are four, I visited 14 pages. But now, instead of taking all the beers, I just won whoops, the f I don't know, 10. So I just won 10, the first 10 beers that are, have an ABV greater than 10. I've just put it this. And now I can go here. I do this. And then getting page one and page two. And that's all. I'm not getting all the pages. And this is thanks of the reactive approach. I'm just getting the first page, filtering, and taking. I've already taken all the beers that I need. No? OK. Next page. Have I already taken all of them? Yes? OK, then stop. This is a really big difference approach of how we are facing nowadays these kind of problems. So again. Um, all the pods, 100 pods running, developing in six minutes. So it's pretty, pretty fast how you can start using Quarkus in Kubernetes and scaling up and down. You've seen my machine with 100 Java instances running. Um, if you want to learn more about all these demos and all the um, Quarkus, you can go to Quarkus.io. There are extensive guides. There is also Quarkus cheat sheet site where you can check this. And also, if there is an, a link, I mean, that if you find in the Google Quarkus slash tutorial or Quarkus Minus tutorial, you will get it to the Red Hat Quarkus tutorial where you see all these demos that I showed you today, plus more and more and more uh, things. And OK, let's win down. We are. Um, 2019 was released Avengers Endgame, the highest grossing movie ever made. For if you had kids, Aladdin and Toy Story 4, Toy Story Repeat, you guess what? Some kind of music that I don't want to comment. I don't know. I'm getting old. And US won the World Cup too. Of course, you can still use your traditional cloud native Java stack. That's fine. And if you put it in your cloud, you're going to make your cloud provider richer. I'm very happy. Or you can move to Quarkus and start saving some money. And one of the important things about Quarkus is that if you don't want to learn JaxRH, you don't want to learn CDI, you don't want to learn Beam Validation, and so on, that's fine. We are providing an API integration with the Spring Boot. So you don't want to use Inject, OK, use AutoWired. At completion time, we're going to change. You don't want to use the path thing, all the get annotations, the JAX RS annotation. That's fine. Use REST controller, get mapper, and all these Spring API um, annotations. And we are going to convert those to JAX RS automatically at compilation time. But it's even more. If you don't want to use Panache, that's fine. You can use Spring data. We are providing integration with the CRUD repository interface as well. So you don't need to learn anything new. Just take your uh, Spring Boot and knowledge and put it on Quarkus. And that's all for Quarkus for this presentation. Of course, there is a lot of things you can see. We've seen a bit of health check, of metrics, but we are also providing integration for security, GWT, Bolt, um, I don't know, all um, MongoDB, Neo4j, uh, infinite span if you want to have any memory data grid. Everything is up there for you, and you are the true heroes here to start using Quarkus. Thank you very much. If you've got any question, any comment, whatever, you can, you can find me on Twitter, in YouTube. I put some videos about Quarkus. 
you can send me an email if you want. Some people ask me, can I send you an email? Yes, of course, the email is here. If not, I will remove it from the slide. So just feel free to send an email. And of course, my blog, lordsofthecharts.com. Thank you very much.